The great sage Confucius and his disciple Zi Gong once encountered a humble maiden washing clothes. Confucius noted that she was wearing a jade pendant on her waist, which he associated with good character. Wishing to test her character, Confucius sent Zi Gong to talk to her and tempt her with his eloquence. She remained unmoved and declined all three of his inappropriate requests. Confucius was delighted and commended her on her understanding of Li, or etiquette. We assume that he was equally as delighted with himself that his assumption of a young lady's character based on her accessories proved to be true. Unsurprisingly, Confucius and his believers were ardent believers of the importance of dressing appropriately. This can also be seen in the Li Ji. One chapter of the Li Ji espouses the virtues of a garment known as the Shen Yi. Worn by both men and women, it was in use all the way from the Spring and Autumn period to the Han Dynasty. A Shen Yi was supposed to have these attributes. It should not be made so short that any of the skin can be seen. The seam at the waist should be lower than the half of the skirt. The sleeves should be joined to the skirt at the armpit in the proper place so that the elbows can freely move. The cuffs are made round to match the compass. The neckline is made as a square to match its squareness. The seams carried at the back descend to the ankles to match the straightness of the plumb line. The edge at the bottom was made as balanced as the steelyard balance to match its evenness. The round design of the cuffs is to allow the wearer to lift his arms while walking, so that he can keep a proper comportment. The edge of the bottom is made like the steelyard balance in order to settle down one's aim and to even one's mind. The shen yi, which means deep clothing, is thus elevated from merely a garment to ward out the code into a complex symbol of the central confusion concept of Li. The parameters of acceptable clothing in the pre-Han era were mostly set by the aristocracy, and the upper class strictly adhered to the rules of Li. Broadly translated as etiquette, Li specified that the various rungs of the social order should be distinct, and clothing was one of the easiest ways to mark that distinction. The distinctions were made mostly via the imagery used on the textiles and the color of the textiles. For instance, the 12 figures used by the emperor represented different attributes of imperial authority. Lesser officials could not use all 12, only specific combinations. Color was also regimented by an official color system tied to the Five Elements theory. For instance, each ruling dynasty justified their rule via the elements concurring one another. The Qin Empire which ruled by water and thus used black as their official color, vanquished the Zhou dynasty, which ruled by fire and used red. Of course, in practice, once the aristocracy had amassed enough power and wealth, adherence to Li regarding the colors of their clothing started to break down in favor of conspicuous consumption. 
This is where we would get the opaline silks and embroideries that China was famed for. Next, let's delve into the roles and beauty standards of women from the Spring Autumn to the Han Dynasty. Toiletry boxes containing makeup items have been discovered in tombs from the Warring States to the Han. These boxes may contain combs, mirrors, hairpins, tweezers, brushes, powder puffs, fragrances, and cosmetics such as white powder and hair pomade. Researchers found that throughout the thousand years or so from the Zhou to the Han dynasties, people with large spirited eyes, white and straight teeth, and clear white skin were considered more attractive. Faces were probably powdered with white powder, and dark brows were drawn on with pens. In the Han Dynasty, there were trends for eyebrows called Guang Mei, and the distant mountain bro Yuan Shan Mei. The ideal was to possess long, dark, thick, shiny locks, and hair extensions were sometimes used to attain this ideal. Jade accessories finished off outfits for everyone who could afford it, that is. Apart from being pretty and helping to weigh down floating skirts, Jade also had a moral value. In the Yu Zao chapter of the Li Ji, the chimes of Jade that a person wears are classified as a sound suitable for an exemplary person to hear. For instance, Confucius had to meet with Nanzi, the wife of a duke. When they talked, Nanzi was half hidden behind a linen curtain, and he could hear her jade pendants clink when she bowed to him. The tinkle of the jade implies that she was properly dressed. As always, whenever women have been beautifying themselves, there has been pushback. The Han poet Cai Yong wrote a poem entitled Nu Jie, preaching that people all know to make up their face, but no one grooms her mind. But how were women actually expected to groom their minds? A woman did not need to read the classics, but she did need to be made of stern moral fiber. In Ban Zhao's book Nu Jie, she exhorts, women's virtue requires neither unparalleled talent nor exceeding brilliance. Women's speech require neither rhetorical eloquence nor sharp words. Women's appearance requires neither a beautiful nor a splendid look or form. Women's work demands no unsurpassable skills. Of women's work, textile production was a critical part and it was inextricably tied to a woman's virtue. It took an enormous amount of time to produce a boat of cloth. And cloth had such stable value that in the Han Dynasty, cloth was used to pay taxes to the government. The ancient Chinese considered weaving to be part of agriculture, and there was an oft-repeated adage that men plow, women weave. Textile work was tedious and monotonous, but it may be easier for women busy with children to engage in, and in the unfortunate event that she was widowed, she could keep herself and her children alive by selling the cloth she wove. Widowed early, Meng Zi's mother toiled at her loom to feed her son and put him through schooling. One day, the young Meng Zi skipped class and came home early. At this, his mother took a knife and sliced through the threads of the cloth she was weaving. She explained that abandoning learning halfway was like cutting a piece of cloth. Everything would go to waste. The Zhou, Qin, and Han dynasties may be murky in the distant past, and texts about women in the past may be particularly sparse. But we can be relatively confident that clothing, spinning, and weaving were integral parts of a woman's life 2,000 years ago.